This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 14th chapter of Genesis, verse 18, beginning with verse 18, Genesis 14, 18. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. The occasion of this verse was news came to Abram that his nephew Lot had been taken hostage by a confederation of kings that had come from the northern area up towards Syria and had invaded the southern plains of the Jordan Valley had captured many cities, had spoiled the cities, and taken many hostages with them. Among those hostages, Lot, the nephew of Abram. So Abram armed 318 of his trained servants that were brought up in his own household. And with his own trained men, Abram took off after these five kings who had just completed this successful sortie into the south land. Abram caught up with them up in the northern area towards Dan where he began to defeat them. They fled all the way as far as Damascus being pursued by Abram where there he defeated these kings. He took back the spoil that they had stolen and he took, of course, again his nephew Lot and his family who had been taken hostage by them. So now he is returning victorious over these five kings that had subdued, or over the four kings that had subdued uh, these five kingdoms in the south. And as he comes by the city of Salem, which many believe to be the first reference in the Bible to Jerusalem, the king of Salem comes out to meet him. He brings to him bread and wine and then he pronounces himself as the priest of the Most High God or God Most High and he blesses Abraham with the blessing of God as he declares how God has delivered the enemies into Abram's hand. Being the priest of God Most High is an interesting observation here. This is the very first mention of a priest in the Bible or the idea of a priest or priesthood. And the first mention of the priesthood or of a man being a priest of God, it happens to be this mysterious, interesting person known as Melchizedek, of which the Bible teaches us very little. Most of what we know about him is found right here in this passage. And we are told that he is the king of Salem. Salem means peace. So he is the king of peace. He is the priest of the Most High God. He offered to Abram bread and water, I mean bread and wine, And then he blessed Abram. Abram, in turn, gave him tithes of all that he possessed. From all of the spoil of the nations that he had just conquered, he paid tithes unto Melchizedek. We know nothing about his family, we know nothing about his genealogy. We do not know really which sons, which of the sons of Noah he descended from. He suddenly appears on the scene, blesses Abraham, receives the tithes, and just as suddenly he disappears from the scene. But then suddenly he pops up again in Psalms. 
A thousand years later, here he suddenly pops on the scene again. And in this psalm, which is prophetic of Jesus Christ, suddenly there comes out of the blue, I have sworn and will not repent, thou art a king forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's all. Silence again. And we know nothing more about him. Until we come to the New Testament and to the book of Hebrews. And there we read of Jesus, our great high priest, who is declared to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. First of all, the idea of a priest. The priest was to be a mediator between God and man. He was a go-between. There was in man that consciousness of his inability to approach God. One of the characteristics of God's nature is his absolute purity. The Bible says concerning God, in him is no darkness at all. God is absolutely pure. Therefore, he's untouchable by me because I'm not pure. Should I touch God, he would be tainted by my touch. So the problem is, how can a sinful, tainted man touch an absolutely pure God? And there was no way there could be a direct touch with God. Therefore, the necessity of a priest, a man who would dedicate his life to God, a man who would live all of his days in close fellowship with God and would then in turn come before God to represent the sinning people. And having, representing, having represented the people before God, he would then return to the people to represent God. And that was the place of the priest, a go-between between, between God and man, sinful God, man and a holy God. The mediator. There is such a vast gulf between God and man. That, that person who says, well, I just go directly to God. I don't need a go-between. I, I just have a good relationship with God, and I just come directly to God. Really does not know the true and the living God who has created the universe. He goes to some God which is a figment of his own imagination, some God that he has created in his own mind, but not unto the true God. He cannot be approached directly by man. God is so awesome. There have been a few times in my life when I came into the awareness of the awesomeness of God. One of the first times that I can remember really realizing and, and being overwhelmed by the awesomeness of God was when I was a child. I lived in Ventura. I grew up not far from the beach. And I can remember this one evening when I was sitting alone on the beach watching the sunset. No one else was around. The beach, as far as I could see in either direction, not a soul. Just the sandpipers as they would chase the waves as they were melting into the sand on the beach. Seagulls flying overhead as the sun was setting behind the Santa Rosa Island. And as I sat there watching the sunset, suddenly there came over me the awesomeness of God who created this ocean, who created that sun, who created those seagulls and the sandpipers, 
who set in motion this whole universe. And I, and I became aware of the awesomeness of God as I sat there. And with that awareness of the awesomeness of God, there also came over me the sense of how nothing I was. Realizing that I live on this little speck of dust we call the planet Earth, hung in one corner of the Milky Way galaxy, one of the billions of galaxies of our universe, I came to the awareness of, man, I am nothing. You know, there was no one else on the beach either direction. I was just all alone, and I felt so small, so nothing, as I sat there watching that sunset with the consciousness of the eternal God. Another time, we were out in the middle of the desert, our family used to have a little travel trailer. And we traveled over a lot of the western part of the United States exploring the glories and the beauties of God's creation as I was growing up. My, my family, my mom and dad were real nature lovers. And I can remember being parked out there in the desert and the trailer only slept four and so that was my mom and dad and my sister and my baby brother. But my other brother and I, we got to sleep outside. We had our own cots and sleeping bags, and we got to sleep outside. And I can remember this one night as we were lying there under the stars. We had eaten dinner, and it wasn't yet dark, but we laid down on our cots, and we were looking up and watching for the first star to appear, and then... It seemed like all of a sudden they just appeared. You know, you see one and then two and then ten and then fifty and then, woo, you know, the whole sky is uh, ablaze with stars. But that evening, as I was lying there and as it really became dark, no moon, just more stars than I've ever observed in my entire life. It was like the whole heaven was just a canopy of stars, solid. And as I looked up in that vast universe, suddenly I realized how vast God was. The greatness and the awesomeness of the God who created this vast universe. And with that awareness of the vastness of God, there came also again the awareness of, I'm nothing. Just, God is so great, so awesome. And I'm just one of these many little specks of dust that are able to move and talk, eat and smell. But oh, who am I in the face of the awesomeness and the vastness of the Creator? I had that same feeling that David must have had when he said, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And when I saw the vast universe, I wondered how God could ever even think about me, how he could ever be aware that I existed. And I felt so nothing so small, in a sense, so vastly removed from God. Because I could see this chasm that existed between the infinite God and me, this finite little insignificant creature out in the middle of a vast desert. When Job was having so many of his problems, one of his friends said to him, Hey, just get right with God and everything will be okay. And he said, Thanks a lot, pal. How can I get right with God? I, I observe the universe that he has created and I, and I see the stars and all, but I can't see him. I know he is there, but I can't see him. And when I look at the vastness of the universe... I'm nothing. 
Who am I that I can come before that kind of a God to plead my cause, to justify myself? He said, and there's no daysman betwixt us or between us who can put his hand on us both. Now with Job, he saw that the gulf between God and man was so great that it could not be bridged by man. And the only answer would be someone who could stand between touching both, but he doesn't exist. What he was actually calling for was a priest, a mediator, a go-between. One who could go between God and man, touching them both, and thus bringing man into touch with the eternal God. And that's the idea of the priest. Here's the first mention of the priest, Melchizedek. A priest of the Most High God. And Abram received from him the bread and the wine and the blessing and in turn gave unto him a tithe of all that he had. A ten. Now, this person, Melchizedek, is a very interesting person in Scripture, first of all, because of his title of priest of the Most High God, first mention of priest, but his second title as the King of Peace. Also a very interesting person in that he ministered to Abram who is the father of all of those who believe. Abram is always pointed to us as the classic example of the beginning of people who believed and really trusted in God. And yet here is a man to whom Abram paid tithes and received a blessing. And the fact that he blessed Abraham put him in a superior spiritual position because the lesser is blessed by the greater. And so Abraham, who is really the top drawer as far as people of faith, is paying tithes and being blessed by this person, Melchizedek, of which we know nothing as far as his background is concerned. He just appears on the scene, blesses Abraham, disappears from the scene. That is why many Bible scholars have come to the conclusion that Melchizedek was none other than Jesus Christ himself. Appearing to Abraham and receiving from him the tithes and granting unto him the blessing. Again, Jesus in disputing with the Pharisees said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. They challenged Jesus saying, you're not 50 years old. What do you mean Abraham saw you? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. But when did Abraham see him? Perhaps when he appeared to him as the priest of the Most High God, the King of Peace. The interesting thing that later on, from Abram, there was to come a family or a tribe known as the Levites. One of the sons of Jacob was named Levite, and later on God chose this particular tribe to be the priestly tribe to the nation of Israel. They were the ones that were chosen to represent the people before God. And of the family of the tribe of Levi, the house of Aaron was chosen for the priestly duties of the great high priest who would enter in before God to represent the people. So the great high priest, once a year, after many sacrifices and offerings and cleansings, would come into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, and there he would stand before God as he would offer before God the sacrifices for the sins of the nation. And this happened every year on Yom Kippur, the most 
holy day of the year in the Jewish calendar as the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies and there stand before God representing the people to God, bringing to God an offering for their sins. The whole Levitical priesthood was actually again showing how unapproachable God was by just a normal man. How that a man, a sinful man could not approach God. And on that day of atonement, as the high priest would first of all make sacrifices for his own sins, as he would bathe in the laver and change his garments and all, and went through all of this preparation before he finally went into the Holy of Holies for the sins of the nation, the people realized how holy God was and how unapproachable he was by sinful man. And so God established a priesthood which was known as the Levitical order from the tribe of Levi. And they were the ones who stood before God to represent the people and stood before the people to represent God. Now as we come to the New Testament, we read that Jesus is our great high priest. Immediately, the Jew would object. He would say, how can Jesus be your high priest? He's not of the tribe of Levi. He's of the tribe of Judah. And not being a Levi, it would be impossible for him to be a priest. After they returned from their Babylonian captivity, there were those who sought to uh, enter the priesthood, but they could not prove their genealogy, and thus they were excluded from the priesthood. They didn't keep the family records during that 70 years, and thus they were excluded from the priesthood because they could have proved that they were of the tribe of Levi. Very important thing if you're going to be a priest. And so in presenting Jesus as our great high priest, it declares that he is of a different order than the Levitical order. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This interesting priest that actually preceded the order of Levi, the first priest mentioned in the Bible the priest who was superior to Abraham and thus superior to any descendant of Abraham. So though Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi, but of the tribe of Judah, and as being from the tribe of Judah could claim the kingship and becomes the king of peace, yet he is a priest also, but after the order of Melchizedek, the superior priesthood. Now, in Psalm 110 again, this interesting prophecy, thou hast sworn and will not relent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Why would the psalmist declare that concerning the Messiah? Out of the blue, there it comes. Only by inspiration of God. There are interesting similarities between Jesus and Melchizedek. Melchizedek offered to Abram what? Bread and wine. And you remember when Jesus had gathered with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it and he offered it to them. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and he offered it to his disciples and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for the remission of sins. Jesus, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And as a priest, his duty is to go before God to represent me. And then he comes to me to represent God. He has bridged this vast chasm between God and man. 
As Job cried for the daysman who could lay his hand upon us both and could not find one, Jesus has become just that. Being in the form of God and not, thought, not thinking it robbery to be equal with God, he came in the form of flesh. John said, we saw him, we gazed upon him, we touched him. That eternal one. And so he lays his hand upon God, being one with God. But having become a man, he lays his hand upon me. And through Jesus Christ, I have been brought in touch with God. He is the mediator, the daysman. And so Jesus Christ abolished the priesthood of the Levitical order or of any other order becoming the great high priest. For there is only one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That is, there's only one true God. There are many false gods, but only one true God. And there's only one mediator between the true God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, who do you have representing you before God? If you tell me, well, I don't need any representation. I'm able to go in anytime I want. We've got a good working relationship, you know, and I just come in anytime I want. I'll tell you that I'm shocked at your audacity and your pride to think that God would touch such as you, tainted as you are by sin. You do not know the righteousness and the purity of the eternal God who has created all things. You don't know him. You may have a fellowship with a God of your own making, but not with the true and the eternal God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by me. You say, Chuck, that's narrow. You're right. It's very narrow. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to life. But broad is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. You say, all paths lead to God. Yeah, there's a lot of broad paths that lead to some God. But not the true and the eternal God. There's only one path and that is Jesus Christ. He is our great high priest who has entered into heaven for us and he is therefore able to save to the uttermost all who will come unto God by him seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for them. You cannot really appear before God without representation. I'm glad that I have Jesus representing me, my great high priest. A priest after the order of Melchizedek who ministers to me of his life and who blesses me as Abram was blessed by Melchizedek. I'm so glad for Jesus Christ, my representative. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the provisions that you have made for us through Jesus. That we don't have to try and come on our own or stand on our own. But we stand before you in Christ. How privileged we are. How blessed. Lord, I pray that today your Holy Spirit will do a work in the hearts of these that are here. Somehow, somewhere, some way, bring them into a consciousness of thy greatness, thy power, the awesomeness and the purity of the true and the living God. 
and becoming aware, Lord, of Thee. Realizing how nothing they are. May with Job their hearts search for the mediator, the daysman, the go-between. And I pray, Father, that they might find Jesus. Your provision. In his name we ask it. Amen. In a way, I feel sorry for the kids growing up today. When I grew up in Ventura, the population was just 5,800 people. It was possible to sit on the beach and be all alone. Can't do that anymore. Beaches are crowded. I hardly believe that when I used to surf down at Huntington, just my two buddies and myself would be the only ones there. Man, you guys can't believe what Huntington used to be. <laughs> all morning long, we could take the north side or the south side of the pier and just have it all to ourselves. Now you go to catch a wave and there's 50 other guys on the same wave. Dog eat dog kind of thing. Flying over the desert the other day, you know, you can see the haze all the way across the United States. From up there looking down, you can, it's no longer really crystal clear. When you get out the desert, it still seems clear, but that's only a relative clearness now. It's a lot clearer than here, yeah, but it's still relative because flying over, you can see that there's a haze over the whole thing. You can't see how many stars are really up there. You see a lot of them, a lot more than you can see here. But And thus, to come into that awareness of the awesomeness of God is more difficult in this crowded society and all that we have. But God being infinite has an infinite way, infinite number of ways to reveal himself and I pray that he will reveal himself to you. In the quietness of your own heart, may God speak to you. And may you become aware how great, how vast, awesome he is and may then through Jesus you come to touch him and feel his touch on you may God draw you into a deeper fellowship and communion and relationship with him than you've ever experienced before that your life may be enriched through that touch of God so God be with you and bless you this week and keep his hand upon you. Maybe this morning you desire to touch God and, and you need God and you're aware of your need, but again you are conscious of that vastness between the two of you. I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room and spend some time there before God. The pastors will be there to help you answer questions or pray with you or help you in whatever way we can because we desire that you come to know God, that you come to touch God, that you come into the experience of the reality of God's touch on you. May you experience it. In Jesus' name.